to everyone, welcome. So we are ready for our innovation as an important issue in our society. So let me introduce Mr. Christian Lyall, UK, head UK of the Mills Fabrica, which is taking this issue with us and he's in a physical presence right now. Christian, welcome. And I leave you the stage. Thank you, Ordiette. Hi, thank you. It's, well, <laughs> that's loud. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Christian Layol. I'm the head of the UK for the Mills Fabrica. Um, we are a new platform in London. We have a ex startup accelerator, an investment fund, co-working spaces, and a concept store for sustainable innovation in London. Uh, so really excited to be here and tell you a little bit about what we have uh, been looking at and studying. So first, I just want to start with uh, some statistics and information. Almost 8 billion people today need to be clothed and fed. And if you add in the next 30 years, it's 2 more billion people. Just like you and me, they will wear countless of wardrobes and eat countless of meals. How on earth is that going to be possible? And that's the question. Starting in the UK with the first industrial revolution in the 1800s, the textiles industry was in fact one of the biggest powers to have lifted society and increased living standards. That was one of the most important innovations in the 1800s, the industrial revolution, where I live now in London and in King's Cross. So industry literally started to change the makeup of society. Then around the late 19th century, or about the time my great-grandmother in the late 19th century was born, we saw a boom of new inventions. Inventions that today make up the infrastructure of our society. Electrical grids, transport hubs, machinery, steel, and unfortunately, petroleum. I remember my great-grandmother telling me until recently, age 99, she was 99, she was telling me how she remembered when she saw the first airplane, the first radio, the first television, the first internet, <laughs> and she never really got around Wi-Fi, so bless her. But what an exciting amount of inventions and innovations that she saw in her lifetime. And it made me start thinking, at what cost? We've done all these amazing things, but at what cost? So that we can take selfies. <laughs> and back in the 1930s, when my great-grandmother was a teenager, there was only two billion people on the planet. This is 1930, two billion people. We're 7.8 billion today. And if you take into account that it took most of humanity to reach one billion people. That is to say that it took us about two million years to reach one billion people. And it only took 200 years to reach seven billion people. That's how big we've grown. And as we've grown, as, and as we've invented, unfortunately, we have emitted quite a bit of greenhouse gases, which everybody knows about. And it, now I want you to imagine with that rapid growth within 200 years and reaching 7 billion people, how much land we have cleared to make cotton and to produce food. In fact, so much of the clothing that we threw away when we were younger is probably still sitting in a landfill today. And what about food production? And I promise this has a bit of a positive ending. But what about food production? In 2016, the World Health Organization declared that 39% of adults over the age of 18 are overweight. That's four in 10. And that means that we are procuring most of the world's food, protein-rich food. We, are, we have so much food that in fact we are wasting, throwing away 30% of it, 40% in America. And you look at the distribution of food, in some underdeveloped countries, the UN estimates, for example, that in Africa, there's 180 million people living in hunger. 
which is kind of crazy. We have all these amazing innovations and we have too much food, but then yet there are almost 200 million people that can't be fed. Now, by finally, by making and growing and transporting and consuming, you think about all those things that we do every day. We have emitted so much greenhouse gases in our planet that we are changing our planet's climate. And that is not something that we can refuse anymore, which is why innovation is so important. Now, remember, we we're one billion humans 200 years ago. We are about to be 10 billion by 2050 in 30 years. That's an additional 2 billion people. So the question that made me prompt this speech was seeing all these inventions and wondering about the cost. And it made me think if we can really continue with our take, make, and waste systems, our population is growing, and it's great. A lot of our population, our living standards are increasing, but at what cost? Back in the day, I remember this time my own grandmother telling me that stores didn't have plastic bags, there was no plastic packaging, and that the milkman came every day to deliver milk in glass jars, and these were recycled. And it seems like there was part of life that was a bit slower, a bit more simple, but also perhaps a little bit less wasteful. As a whole, we have achieved great things, great inventions. And our inventions have led us to higher living standards. But at the same time, never have we done so much damage to our planet. Now, the question is, how do we continue to support the growth of our population to reach 10 billion? How do we continue to reach, um, to make sure that in the year 2050, 10 billion of us can have fireworks and champagne and continue celebrating? We dug ourselves into this hole by innovating. The question is, can we fundamentally change the way we innovate in a more responsible manner to restore balance? I think that's very much part of the mission that we have at the Mills Fabrica with the work that we're doing. We're investing and nurturing innovators, young startups with great ideas. Otherwise, how do we manage the food distribution and the clothing that everybody eats, the countless meals that, you have, that we have throughout our lifetimes? Now, the good news is that the tide is turning. Governments are making pledges. Companies are making commitments. And consumers are being more conscientious and more demanding as well. We all know of the Paris Agreement. We all have heard the term ESG. Um, I bet you there's a head of sustainability sitting in this room somewhere, or companies have hired a head of sustainability in the last year or two. Now, but it's not enough. It's unfortunately not enough because we haven't really made a dent. And in fact, the most recent report that came out a few days ago shows that our greenhouse gas emissions have gone up <laughs> while we're trying to go down to zero in 2050. So it's, it's really dire. And part of the reason is that we don't agree on measuring the same things. So how can we actually track progress if we're not measuring the same things? Unfortunately, we won't get to net zero by 2050, not unless we change the way we fundamentally work with each other. We have to collaborate, open our books, and fashion and luxury are very exclusive and is certainly type of the mentality that we have. But going forwards, we have to become a lot more collaborative, open, open sourced, share our secrets, share what we've learned so that we can move forward together to reduce waste and to reduce carbon emissions. And also, not to mention, it's very confusing for the consumers out there trying to make more informed decisions about what they're purchasing. So how, how do we emit less? How do we continue growing? How do we do that? The good news is that as we speak, there are countless of startups and big companies and schools trialing in labs and in universities, new systems to fix the things that we have broken. 
They're coming up with new material innovations. Some of them are right behind me. They're coming up with new, better systems that manage distribution and waste more efficiently. Or they have business models that take into account discarding into waste. So two of the recent investments that we've made this year are interesting examples. Uh, one company based in Cambridge is called Supplant. Now what they're doing is taking, making an alternative to sugar out of food waste that is better than the conventional cane sugar. And it's better in different ways. It mimics the same thing. It does caramelization. And I'm speaking about food because food is related very closely with fashion as well. But this alternative sugar has the same properties as cane sugar, and it has half the calories, which is fantastic. And it uses agricultural waste. So instead of leaving it on the fields, it's used to make sugars that we all need for baking, eating cookies and making the gelato that we all love. Now, that's an amazing technology, and that technology they're also testing into beauty products for exfoliation purposes, for detergents. Most, most detergents have petroleum, by the way. They're fossil fuels. Uh, it, it, it's everywhere. So nurturing innovations like these are really important. Another company called Colorifics um, is doing some amazing things. Now, th these are scientists that are, again, based in Norwich and Cambridge and have no background in fashion whatsoever. But they saw the pollution in the rivers on a trip to India, and they decided to do something about it. And what they're doing is they are able to take the color of a banana or the green of a leaf, and they can take that color and upload it into bacteria so that that bacteria grows in the color of the banana, for example. So they're brewing it like beer. And that means it's an entirely bio-based system, zero toxics. They're reducing greenhouse gases by 100% because the water temperatures don't have to be as hot as in conventional dyeing. So this is some amazing innovations. And there's countless others of ways that we can continue to consume We'll have to change how we consume, but there are innovations that will allow us to continue and support the systems that we've built today. And th just a final kind of reminder, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation categorized that the fashion and food industries are the two most polluting industries, or among the, two, the most polluting industries in the world. And Again, remember, we're almost 8 billion people today. That's a lot of people with 2 more billion coming in the next 30 years. How do we continue to do that and decrease the greenhouse gas emissions? The only way I think we can do that is by innovating better and looking at the things that we can do in a more sustainable way to reduce waste, to reuse, and to lower greenhouse gas emissions. At DeMille's Fabrica, we are essentially geared to help and support the sustainable innovators um, for the future of the industries. We've opened our first international site in London. Uh, we have one in Hong Kong. And what we are doing is helping to create a bridge between two of the world's biggest manufacturers in food and fashion across Europe and Asia. Um, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day, and there's another talk. So very happy to speak to anybody who's interested to learn more about our startup accelerator, our investment fund, um, and the work that we're doing for sustainable innovation. Thank you so much.